Well, I hope you've been enjoying this session so far today. You know, as, as John mentioned in the, the last uh, session, there's aspects of this war that may not get much attention or we may not know much about. And so our next panel features, you know, some of those aspects of the war that we may not know much about. Now, we've taken the title from our new special exhibit that I hope you have a chance to see, Our War II. Uh, we even broaden this, though, a bit um, in this. And we'll hear about Mary Sears and Marine scientists. We'll hear about Hispanic Americans. We'll hear about Japanese Americans. And I think there's some uh, incredible stories there that many of us won't know much about. Now, leading the discussion is our Institute's fellow, Dr. Steph Hinterschitz. Uh, she'll offer some questions and comments for our panelists after their presentations. I think this will be an engaging conversation. Now, uh, as you recall, uh, some of you, we met Steph yesterday, but uh, for those that, that weren't there, you know, Steph was uh, with us in the Jenny Craig Institute for over two years, uh, most of that period as senior historian. Uh, she worked on our leadership initiatives, public programs, higher ed, online articles, and of course, uh, content for Liberation Pavilion, which was, uh, you know, pretty all-encompassing. Uh, we thank you for that, Steph. Um, hopefully you'll have a chance to see that if you haven't already in the open house period. I'd offer that up as well. And then this fall, uh, she redeployed uh, to Maxwell Air Force Base, uh, where she's on the faculty now. But uh, we're fortunate to have Steph with us. I know she'll give her disclaimer that this does not represent uh, U.S. Air Force policy. <laughs> but with that disclaimer, we'll turn it over to you. All right. Good luck. Thank you, Mike. So yes, everything I say it's, has nothing to do with the Air Force or the Department of Defense, all that stuff. So thank you all for being here again, and I'm excited to see all of you again. And if you weren't here yesterday, welcome. And like Mike mentioned, our panel is going to cover a lot of ground. I have a challenge for you, though. So you might look at the different topics that will be represented here. And they are, traditionally in the narrative of World War II history, not always as integrated into the narrative or the bigger story as they should be. And I think it's a little easy, if you're looking at the program, to look at this panel and see it as, oh, here's a panel of underrepresented stories, or here's a panel of three different unique groups and their experiences, which they are. But by the time we're done hearing our panelists and their presentations and their research, I want you to think about what do you now know about the war more generally that you didn't know about before just by hearing about these three different groups. So you're not just going to learn about the groups. You're going to learn different aspects of World War II that you did not know about before. Or maybe you already did, but you're going to learn a lot more. So that's my challenge to you. Again, when we're done here, think about what do you now know about World War II that you did not know before just by hearing about groups that aren't traditionally included in World War II history. OK? So that's giving you homework. Hope you pay attention and be active, active listeners. But we've got on our panel three accomplished public historians. So we have Kate Mizumichi next to me. And then we have Dave Gutierrez and Jim McNaughton. And they are going to, like I said, cover a lot of ground and give us some really great presentations. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Kate. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, I want to thank uh, Steph and uh, Jeremy Collins uh, for inviting me to speak to you here today. And thank all of you for, for coming for this presentation uh, on Mary Sears and the uh, marine scientists who uh, helped win World War II. How does this? There. Oh, there we go. Now we've gone too far. Okay. Got to get the advertisement in. There we go. Okay. Our story begins with, uh, with the attack on Pearl Harbor. And although the attack was not the knockout blow that the Japanese intended, it certainly uh, disabled our Pacific forces to a certain degree. And it was a, such great concern to President Roosevelt that he confided to his wife, Eleanor, that he really didn't know how we would go about fighting this war. And this is because we were going to fight an entirely different war than we had ever fought before in the history of our country. Already, we had been uh, helping to keep the Atlantic safe for merchant shipping. 
But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, we had a whole new ocean that we were going to have to defend. And this was the largest ocean, the Pacific Ocean, 64 million square miles of sea that we really didn't know all that well outside of Pearl Harbor. Now, unlike World War I, World War II was going to play a huge <coughs> role in the Pacific campaign of the war. In, in World War I, shown here on the left, uh, our troops would uh, sail across the Atlantic. They would dock in friendly harbors. They would get out, have a cigarette, maybe have a, a hand of poker or something, and then they would make their way to the front. Not so in World War II, not so in the Pacific Campaign, where every single invasion would require fighting their way to shore. Not only that, but as this audience is well aware, an amphibious um, operation is undoubtedly the, one of the most complex military operations that one can undertake. It requires coordination between multiple branches of the service. It requires uh, shipping, men, supplies, equipment, uh, thousands of miles from the West Coast. And along the way, you don't know what you're going to encounter. It could be a typhoon, a hurricane, rogue wave. So just getting people there, getting the right equipment there, was a battle in and of itself. Not only that, think about this. Our war planners, as they were contemplating how our men were going to fight and what the series of, of the invasions would be across the Pacific, they were thinking about the enemy and how to approach the enemy with weapons. They were not thinking about this jagged surf zone that our men would have to traverse to get to the, uh, to the shore. Uh, and these conditions that we really didn't know about due to the ocean, due to waves, currents, uh, tides, they had the potential to create absolute chaos in any kind of amphibious uh, operation. Now, this is Mary Sears, who before the war was a um, marine biologist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And it's, it's kind of ironic that Mary Sears, who became our first full-time oceanographer of the Navy, when the war broke, off, broke out, she was uh, off the coast of Peru doing research on a fishing trawler. And the reason she was there is because women were prohibited from going out on seafaring expe expeditions here in the United States. So that's where she was. Eventually, she made her way to the Navy. Of course, it took a while, because women were not allowed to join the Navy until July of uh, 1942. And then there was a little problem with her, you know, her physical exam getting in. She was initially turned down because she had a history of arthritis in her little finger, and we all know how important that is uh, for <laughs> turning out oceanographic reports. But Mary Sears, our first full-time oceanographer of the Navy, finally arrives at the Naval Hydrographic Office in Suitland, Maryland, in April of 1943. Now think about that date for a second. We have been at war for a year and a half. The Pacific Campaign is well underway, and our first full-time naval oceanographer is taking her seat uh, in the Maritime Security Division of the Hydrographic Office by herself to undertake all the uh, oceanographic intelligence needs for uh, the Navy. Sounds like a great setup. Well, one of the first things she did was she went about building up her unit, and we have these ideal people here to join the Navy and become um, <coughs> naval oceanographers. We have Finner Chase, who was a uh, hermit crab specialist from Harvard. We have uh, Dora Henry, who was known as the Barnacle Lady up in, uh, she, was, she was from the University of Washington, and she, was kind of, she had an interesting sideline up in Puget Sound. When the police pulled a corpse out of the water, they would call Dora uh, to help them figure out where did the body come from and how long it had been in the water because she could analyze the barnacles on the shoes and on the pants uh -huh. legs and she could figure out 
it, she could help them date where, where this person came from. And then we had Mary Greer, who had some flirtations with the Communist Party, but she was our foremost, <laughs> that didn't matter, she was our foremost oceanographic librarian, also from the University uh, of Washington. Uh, so this was our group. And remember, we had less than 100 what we would call oceanographers in our country at that time. So we couldn't be too picky about who was going to help with this mission. Uh, Mary Sears, I, I can't go into too much detail because you know, we, we're on a little bit of a, a timeline here, but uh, Mary Sears helped with many aspects of oceanographic intelligence during her time uh, at the hydrographic office. She helped with uh, producing these silk maps that aviators wore. She worked on the, uh, putting the currents into the maps, the direction and force of the currents. In case a pilot had to ditch in the ocean, he could perhaps navigate to a friendly uh, shore. She helped with uh, submarine warfare and helping um, uh, naval skippers identify where the thermoclines were so they could find a safe zone to, to hide from uh, the German wolf packs. But this was probably her biggest contribution to uh, oceanographic intelligence during World War II. And um, there was something called the Joint Army-Navy Intelligence Studies that um, <coughs> the uh, Joint Chiefs thought it might be a good idea. Again, this was all going on about mid-1943. Mid thought it might be a good idea that we gather some information about these places we were contemplating invading. And so they created the concept of the Joint Army-Navy Intelligence uh, Studies. And what these studies were about were collecting all sorts of geographic, topographic, oceanographic, socioeconomic, all sorts of data. Anything that would affect an operation by land, sea, or air would be in these studies. They had up to 13 chapters. And Mary Sears was responsible for chapter three on oceanography, which included such data as tides, waves, currents, coordinating the, the daylight with the tide, bottom sediments, acoustic conditions, bioluminescence. I don't have time to tell you where all of this data comes from, but if you ask me during the Q&A, I certainly have an answer for that question. Uh, I can think of no better example of how important oceanographic intelligence can be to an amphibious operation than what took place at the Battle of Tarawa. And at the time that the Battle of Tarawa took place, our naval oceanographers, these joint Army-Navy history studies, were still getting up to speed. They were still trying to decide what font it was going to be and who the printer was going to be. You know, I downloaded all these minutes from the meetings of these uh, Janus people. And it's maddening. You're sitting and you're going, hey, Tarawa's coming up. You people need to go ahead and pick a font and get this information out there to, to the troops. But they're just really messing around with, with other things. So we don't have a Janus report for Tarawa. And so what happened at Tarawa is that our, uh, our objective was Betty O Island. And if you notice this, it was completely surrounded by a coral reef. So on the eve of battle, the question was, and it was a relatively simple question for a naval oceanographer, would the tides be sufficient for the Higgins boats to cross the reef? And the Higgins boats, need, Higgins boats needed a four-foot draft, a minimum four-foot draft. Well, the, the most recent nautical charts were 100 years old, so they consulted some locals who said, oh, absolutely, you'll get five feet at Tarawa. Don't worry, you'll get five feet. But what happened on November 20th, 1943, is that it was one of two days in the calendar year where a NEAP tide, N-E-A-P tide, prevailed. And a NEAP tide is the narrowest of tides, so you're not going to have your high and low. And not only was it a neap tide, it was a neap tide when the moon is an apogee at its furthest distance from the, from the Earth. And so what that meant was we had not only a super narrow tide, but a super narrow and low tide. So that instead of getting the required four feet, the tide was 3.3 feet for the next 48 hours. And what do you think happened then? the men could not get across the coral reef in the Higgins boats. And a great many of them had to ditch. They had to walk into 
it, fierce Japanese fire, and it was a total and complete disaster, as most of you know. We lost 20% uh, of the landing force. That's over 1,000 men of the initial 5,000 uh, men in the landing force. 300 were lost just trying to get to shore. And uh, these were the Amtraks, which were the first generation of the amphibious uh, tractor. It was actually designed not to carry men, but to carry cargo. And you can see what happened. Almost all of them were shot up by the Japanese right off the get-go because they were a bigger target. And uh, these things were, were just total, complete disaster. So as a consequence, Admiral Nimitz uh, came over there and toured about three days later. And he, of course, he was disgusted. Uh, with what he found, but there were also, all of this was on the front page of the New York Times for days, and there were uh, congressional hearings, and uh, people figured out, look, if this is the way the Pacific campaign is going to go, we're not so sure, <laughs> we're not so sure this is a good idea, because look, Tarawa is down here, it is down here, and we have a very long way to go to get to Japan, so something had to change. Something has to change. And what, what happened, and I know this from downloading thousands of documents from the Freedom of Information website, is that the Janus people, somebody said to them, you need to align these reports with these campaign, with the, with the targets as they are scheduled to occur. Seems simple. That's what they did. I'm not saying that that alone straightened everything out. Believe me, if you look close enough, you will find some kind of oceanographic mishap on just about every one of these uh, island assaults along the way. But I can tell you that by the time they got to Okinawa, the landing was textbook. They knew where to go. They knew what side of the island to go in on. They knew what day and time to go. The equipment was better. The, the troops were more experienced. It was a combination of factors. But along the way, the oceanographic reports did get out sooner and did get incorporated in some of these battle plans. This is the post-war commendation to Mary Sears from Admiral Nimitz. He says, in your capacity of oceanographer, you were frequently called upon by the Joint Chiefs of Staff to furnish critically valuable information for use in combat operations. Good job, Mary. What did Mary do after the war? She went back to Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Institution where she spent her entire career. She helped organize the field of oceanography. She was the co-editor of the first uh, academic journal for oceanography, Deep Sea Research. And she convened the first international congress on oceanography in New York City at the UN in 1959. So she left quite a legacy just in civilian oceanography, but also left a huge legacy in naval oceanography. Right up the road here, the Stennis Space Center in Bay St. Louis, uh, Mississippi, is the Navo Oceano, the Naval Oceanographic Office, where today, a 1,000 men and women are doing the job that Mary Sears and her crab experts did during World War II. <laughs> and I can assure you that they are taking a much different approach than, than what the Navy took during the war. They are now able to proactively identify hot spots where we may be called upon to have an operation. And they are gathering this information in advance. And guess what? They're gathering it on the USNS Mary Sears. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm to your questions. Thank you, Kate. And it, I, I didn't go into a lot of the details about the bios, but if you flip through the program, you can learn more. And, and you probably can tell Kate hates science, clearly. <laughs> hates it. So thank you, Kate. We'll turn it over to Dave now. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to really talk about uh, the subject of Hispanic Americans' uh, contributions in World War II. I spent five years researching my first book, uh, Patriots from the Barrio, the true story of the only all Mexican American U.S. Army unit in World War II. And after the, getting that book published, 
I wanted to make sure that I continued to do research on Hispanic American contributions. This is a subject that I never saw in any type of curriculum in school when I was growing up. Never, never saw it, never heard of it. Uh, although if you walked into any Hispanic American home, I tell people you're gonna see two things. You're gonna see a, a picture of the Virgin Mary up on the wall <laughs> and all of the family members that have served this nation. So I wanted to continue to look for stories and I came across an article that someone wrote and had two sentences. Oscar Perdomo, born in El Paso, Texas, became the last American ace in a day of World War II. And I'm thinking to myself, how do I not know this story? How, how is it that we don't hear about a Mexican-American ace in World War II? Now, in my first book, in Patriots from the Barrio, I spent, again, five years of research, and a lot of that research was genealogy research. I had connected with over 60 different families of the men that served with my relative in World War II to be able to tell their true story. And so I wanted to do the same thing. I went and found Oscar Perdomo, put together his family tree, and started doing uh, his re research on his family. I found his son, Ken, living in Phoenix, Arizona. And I reached out to Ken and said, look, uh, I'm very interested in, in telling your dad's story, not just in an article. I felt that his story needs to be told completely in detail. And, uh, you know, I might have mentioned to him that my first book was already picked up in Hollywood. I, I might have dropped that <laughs> little, <laughs> little nugget. Uh, but Ken was very interested in that, and he sends me this box completely of photos of Oscar um, military service, photos that Oscar himself had taken, and the rosters of the 464th uh, Fighter Squadron. So I spent the last couple of years trying to put this man's story together, because I think that this is a very inspirational story that the rest of America sh should learn about. So I learned that Oscar was born in El Paso, Texas. At an early age, his family was living in poverty, moved to East LA. Oscar Perdomo grew up in the Boyle Heights area of East LA, attended Garfield High School. And as his son says, my dad at a young age was always racing cars with his hair on fire always looking to go fast. Speed was his thing. Always wanted to just be flying. It was natural for him to want to become a pilot. And after doing flight training in LA and finally getting his wings in Arizona, uh, he became a first lieutenant and was assigned to the 464th Fighter Squadron. Oscar was a very sharp dresser that a lot of the men in the unit nicknamed him Zoot for Zoot Suit. So he was known as Zoot in, in, in the fighter squadron. This is the emblem of the 464th Fighter Squadron. They were assigned to the 507th Fighter Group. When Oscar arrived with the 464th, they were, it had already been training in Nebraska, and he joined them when they were in Texas at Dalhart uh, Airfield. From there, they were in Washington before they were loaded up on a ship and ended up on the, on the little island of Oshima right outside Okinawa. The same isle, island where Ernie Pyle was killed. They arrived in July of 1945, almost the end of the war. As a matter of fact, Oscar 
only flew 10 combat missions. And the first mission, he was flying, uh, they were flying uh, cover for B-24s, uh, bombing. So the United, we had already dropped two atomic bombs on Japan, and the Japanese had not surrendered. So the 464th Fighter Squadron in August of 1945 were still flying missions. So on August 13th, Oscar's group goes up and are flying a mission over South Korea. And they are jumped by enemy fighters. Again, we had already dropped two bombs on Japan. They hadn't surrendered. And here they are flying a mission over South Korea, and they're getting jumped and outnumbered. During this firefight, Oscar shoots down five enemy planes in a single day, becoming the last American ace in a day of World War II. Now, I learned that there was nearly 4,600 fighter pilots in the U.S. Army Air Corps. 41 of them, only 41 of them would become ace in a day. Very rare feat for a fighter pilot. After the war, Oscar continued to serve in the U.S. Air Force, be, uh, coming up to the rank of major, still flying test, doing test pilot, piloting for the United States Air Force. Oscar had two sons, both serving in Vietnam. His oldest son, Ken, was already there serving with the, with the U.S. Army. And his youngest son, Chris, was part of the 191st Assault Helicopter Company. He was a gunner aboard a Huey. Chris did not have to go to Vietnam because his older brother was already there. But he could, they, nobody could talk him out of it and he was killed in action, serving with the 191st Assault Helicopter Company. This event changed Oscar for the, for the rest of his life, really. I don't think he ever, and how, this is how his son put it, he never recovered from that. Oscar retired the same year that his son was killed, and eight years later, um, he was, he was dead also. Again, this is a story that I thought that we absolutely have to be able to tell in detail. And I was glad that I was able to get the roster of the 464th Fighter Squadron and now connected with a lot of their family members to be able to tell the entire squadron story of what happened to the 464th Fighter Squadron uh, during World War II. Again, this is, this is a, a piece of history that I never learned in school, and I'm happy that my first book is now being used in high schools and in universities, and we're hoping that Oscar's story will soon be you know, taught in, in, in schools as well. Uh, I want to thank uh, my good friend Nick Mueller, the founding chairman, uh, for his uh, support throughout, throughout the time. Nick and, uh, Je is that you, Jeffrey? Jeffrey Sammons, uh, all three of us are part of the advisory panel to the National Medal of Honor Museum that's being built in Arlington, Texas. So thank you, Nick, for your support. Uh, and thank you to the National World War II Museum. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> Sorry. Ooh, thank you, Dave. And now we'll hear from Jim. Thank you, Steph. Steph um, um, exercised her prerogative as the panel chair to have us talk in order of height. 
<laughs> but more importantly, um, this is a, truly a joint panel. We've now heard about uh, Mary Sears and oceanography. We've heard about uh, Oscar Perdomo and fighter pilots up to the final days of the war against Japan. And now I'm going to talk about an important uh, our element of the Army's land power in the Pacific War, the Nisei linguists. Uh, the only Japanese word you need to pay attention to is Nisei, which means second generation, uh, a, um, a, a person of Japanese descent who was um, born in the United States and therefore a US citizen. More typically, their parents were Japanese immigrants, but often had lived in the States for decades uh, before they began raising families. Uh, this picture is the young man with the glasses is Harry K. Fukuhara, born in Seattle, Washington. I'll tell you more about him in a minute. Um, this is on Itapi, New Guinea in early 1944. He's interrogating Japanese prisoners. Now imagine if you're a regimental commander or a company commander uh, and working your way through the jungle, your soldiers are getting killed and wounded at a rapid rate, the climate is miserable but you don't know what the Japanese are doing out there in front of you. If you had someone like uh, Sergeant Harry Fukuhara, uh, in, if you could capture Japanese documents or, um, or even some Japanese prisoners, uh, you could get that rapid tactical intelligence about what units are you opposing, what are their strengths, what is their morale, uh, and get it in real time, which uh, anyone who's served in a theater of operations knows that um, the high-level intelligence that might be available up at the Pentagon level uh, often doesn't trickle down to that regimental commander or that company commander who might need it for the what's on the other side of the hill in front of them. The Pacific War has been called a race war. We've heard that in earlier panels, and there's certainly a lot of truth to that. But I have to say that's not the whole story. In addition to African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and other uh, uh, races and ethnic groups that fought for the American Armed Forces. There were Japanese Americans. Um, some of those soldiers, in fact, their parents were from Japan um, when they were serving in the US Army in the Military Intelligence Service, the MIS. The MIS used several thousand Nisei uh, as translators and interpreters during the war in a variety of assignments. They served at regimental and division level on up to theater intelligence centers. Um, and then at the end of the war, the demand for military linguists in fact grew to support the occupation of Japan. So to talk briefly about who these guys were and how they contributed to the American effort in the Pacific War, I want to focus on three individuals. Um, first, I will talk about, um, I'll get back to Harry shortly. But here's someone who never deployed. This is John Fuccio Iso, and I think he's one of the unsung heroes of the military language efforts during World War II. Um, in the early 1941, the War Department Military Intelligence Division, or G2, realized that in the event of a conflict with Japan, the US Army would need uh, people who could read and speak Japanese. And they turned to a likely source because the draft had begun in the fall of 1940, several thousand uh, young men, Nisei of Japanese extraction, had already been drafted and were in uniform sitting in training camps in Hawaii and on the West Coast. So uh, in July of 1941, the War Department Military Intelligence Division ordered 4th Army headquarters on the West Coast to establish a secret Japanese language school at the Presidio of San Francisco. So that summer, several Caucasian officers who had served in Tokyo in the interwar period and learned Japanese um, visited every single training camp on the West Coast in search of these Nisei who could read or speak Japanese. What they found was appalling, which was that the vast majority of them were so Americanized that they spoke very, very little Japanese. So great success to the American public school system um, and, uh, and there was actually a failure on the part of their parents who kept trying to push them into after-school Japanese language classes for which, for the most part, these boys were not interested in up until the war broke out. <coughs> um, in, after interviewing over 1,300 draftees, 
the, the uh, intelligence officers selected 60 Nisei who they thought were capable of further training um, and brought them to the Presidio of San Francisco. The lead of that group was John Fujio Iso. Iso was uh, born and raised in Burbank, California and had attended, uh, was a stellar student in middle school and high school, uh, attended Brown University on a scholarship, went on to Harvard Law School, and then worked for a New York law firm which sent him to Tokyo in the late 30s. Uh, he was going to continue practicing law in there and in Manchukuo, but he fell seriously ill in the fall of 1940 and was returned to the United States where he was promptly drafted. So <laughs> PFC John Iso uh, reported for his first duty assignment in a army motor pool and the motor sergeant said, just what we need, another goddamn lawyer. Um, <laughs> fortunately, the intelligence officers found him and, uh, and pulled him up to the Presidio of San Francisco and because of his excellent Japanese language skills and his training and his education in the United States, wanted to use him to lead the language uh, training uh, effort. However, he was still a PFC. So they discharged him and worked him as an army civilian for the next several years. And he became the director of academic training at the school. The best linguists were like John uh, uh, ISO because they were Kibei, second Japanese word, sorry I lied to you, uh, and those are Japanese Americans who then spent time back in, the, in, in Japan, their parents' homeland, often studying or living with grandparents um, and, uh, and learning excellent Japanese there and then were able to return to the States before the war began. So in the 1st of November 1941 at the Presidio of San Francisco, the 4th Army Intelligence School began with 60 students, uh, Nisei students, and four instructors headed by John Fujio Iso. Uh, they continued training uh, right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. They redoubled their efforts knowing how serious uh, the need was going to be. The first class graduated on the 1st of May 1942. A total of 30 graduates were sent overseas, a paltry number compared to the numbers that would be needed in the future. Uh, they were sent everywhere from Alaska to the South Pacific. The school was forced to leave the West Coast because uh, the commander of Fourth Army was implementing Executive Order 9066 and removed all personnel of, and individuals and civilians of Japanese ancestry, regardless of age or citizenship, moved them into the interior camps in the United States, uh, in the interior of the United States. Uh, advance one further. Um, uh, jumping forward a little bit, in uh, the fall of 1944, the uh, General Clayton Bissell, the War Department G2, arrived and, uh, at the school to visit the language school, which by then had moved into Minnesota. It was on camp, uh, it was on uh, Fort Snelling at that time um, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And um, he noticed that there was a civilian instructor teaching uh, Army personnel, and he said, you can't do that. That's really not uh, protocol. So they gave John Iso a direct commission to major, which made him actually the highest ranking Japanese American in the US Army at the time. Uh, let me jump forward to another character, uh, Hoichi Kubo. Kubo was born and raised in Maui on a plantation in a Japanese community in Maui, spoke excellent Japanese. He was attending the University of Hawaii as a pre-med student when uh, the war broke out, or he was, I'm sorry, he was drafted, and was uh, stationed at Wheeler Field on the 7th of December, 1941, and actually witnessed the Japanese attack on the US fleet, well, at, the, at Wheeler Field, of course, for the Army Air Corps and the fleet in Pacific uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, Kubo uh, went on to be assigned to the uh, 100th Infantry Battalion, and that's where he wanted to be, to fight with his buddies but he was uh, grabbed by military intelligence because he had the language skills and they assigned him eventually to the 27th Infantry Division. That's the patch you see on his left shoulder right there. Um, Kubo served in four campaigns with the 25th Division. The first one was on the island of Macon where as an additional duty he was assigned as a driver to the first uh, US Army uh, military historian, a, guy, a colonel then uh, SLA Marshal. Uh, it's mentioned in one of uh, Marshall's books. 
um, went on to serve in the invasion of Majuro, and then Saipan, and then Okinawa. I want to talk about Saipan for a minute. Uh, on Saipan, on the 7th of July, he interviewed a Japanese prisoner who had been captured, who said, you know, I want to get out of here. I want to get off this island. Well, why do you want to get off the island? Well, because of the gyokusai that's coming. Gyokusai is another Japanese word, which Kubo explained to me when I interviewed him, that means to smash the jewel. This was the phrase that the Japanese army used for an all-out attack, what the Americans would call a banzai attack. They call it gyokusai. He reported up to his chain of command, and they were able, they, with just literally a few hours of warning, were able to prepare for this final Japanese banzai attack, which even with preparation took 400 soldiers' lives and wounded U.S. soldiers and wounded over 500 American soldiers. Over 4,000 Japanese soldiers died in the attempt. Uh, after the battle uh, is where Kubo really came into his own. He, um, there were many civilians that were hiding throughout Saipan, uh, many of them in caves, and word came down to his regiment that there was a large group hiding in a cave on the coastline of Saipan uh, with a lot of civilians. And so he went there, realized the situation, and had himself lowered on a rope down into the cave where there were eight Japanese soldiers holding 122 civilians captive. He brought K rations with him uh, to share with the Japanese soldiers and explained to them, you may want to die for the emperor, and that's fine, but these civilians don't need to die for the emperor. And he went on to say, both of my grandfathers fought during the Russo-Japanese War in the 5th and 6th Division, and their units were much better than your crappy unit. And by the way, <laughs> this, is, this is a Hawaii bo attitude. By the way, uh, I'm an Army Sergeant, and I outrank all of you, so let these civilians go. They did. They actually <laughs> let the civilians go. And, um, and he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his efforts. Uh, really for his uh, peaceful efforts. Let me go on to, Harry Fukuhara was in the first um, uh, photograph. Here he is a year or two later as Second Lieutenant Harry Fukuhara. Uh, as I said, he was born in uh, uh, Seattle, Washington. Uh, his father died when he was 12 or 13 years old. And so his mother took him back to their, her hometown in a city called Hiroshima. And he lived for five years in Hiroshima, went to school there. When he turned 18, which was draft age in Japan, his mother sent him back to the United States. Um, and so uh, he was fluent in Japanese, but was a loyal American and uh, served during the war. Um, and uh, at the end of the war, by the way, he was commissioned in mid-August 1945. He served in the occupation of Japan. In the early weeks of the occupation, he was able to go back to Hiroshima and found his mother. Uh, who had survived the blast, fortunately. Uh, he had an older brother who died of radiation poisoning, or radiation uh, sickness uh, soon afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Harry continued in the US Army and retired in 1971 as a full colonel, and then went on to work as a uh, DA civilian uh, for another 20 years and retired again. He's in the MI Hall of Fame today. By the end of the war, the Military Intelligence Service Language School had graduated over 2,000 Nisei. By the spring of 1946, they had graduated a total of, of 6,000. Um, they served throughout the Pacific theaters, the Southwest Pacific, the Central Pacific, and, uh, and in uh, uh, CBI theater. And at the end of the war, the language requirements stepped up dramatically. And, uh, and there were oh, almost 2,000 still in training, and the recruiters were still out, including some recruiters going into the internment camps and trying to recruit young men right out of the camps. In 1948, the director of the, the Southwest Pacific Intelligence Center, Sidney Mashbeer, published an article in the Saturday Evening Post in which he wrote, I know that the Nisei's faithful service in the, to the United States saved many thousands of American lives and shortened the war by months. Uh, so in conclusion, a couple points. The Japanese language school moved to the Presidio of Monterey in 1946, where it continues today as the Defense Language Institute, training dozens of languages uh, to military linguists of all, all the services. Um, 
The MIS had a lasting impact in, in America. I would mention just a couple. Uh, one MISer uh, went into politics in Hawaii and became the governor of Hawaii in 1974, George Ariyoshi, and was an important bridge between the reborn Japan and the United States in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I will also mention the current commander of U.S. Cyber Command, Paul Nakasone. I want to shout out to his father, Edwin Nakasone, who was also in the military intelligence service. So it continues to this day. The war against Japan was a race war, uh, but that's not the whole story. And I'll end with this final photograph of Hoichi Kubo on Saipan comforting a young child uh, who was wandering on the battlefield at the time. And I think this expresses the humanity uh, that the MIS Nisei were able to bring to the occupation as well as the war itself. Thank you very much. All right, so thank you to our panelists. And I have a couple minutes, actually. I, I have questions for our panel before we open it up to all of you. So I'm excited. I can, I can ask you questions now. <laughs> I do want to ask, Actually, two for everyone on the panel. I have many questions I could ask each of you individually, but let's, let's tie it all together and start it off by describing how some of these stories, really all of your stories that you presented, aren't typically seen as, as part of this bigger story of World War II. They're obviously important. You showed us that very well with your presentations, but I don't think they're there are immediate things that kind of come to mind when we talk about World War II. So my question is a big one. Why is it, why do you think it is that these, everyone who you discuss, which are so important for the war and the effort and what the outcome was, but why are they overlooked? Why are they not cent like central to the story of World War II? Yeah. I'll, ta I'll take that right off. Um... We know that a half a million Hispanics served in World War II. And the big issue is we as Latino Hispanics have got to get better at recording and documenting our own history. It's vital. Uh, I don't think it should have taken 70 years for someone to write the book about the only all Mexican American US Army unit in World War II. Um, we can point the fingers like, oh, we were left out here and we were left out there, but if we don't take the initiative ourselves and write, record, and document our own history, uh, no one's going to be breaking down your door to do it for you. Um, so I really think that we as Hispanics have got to look in the mirror. And, and, and get better at that. Thank you. Yeah, Jim. Um, I'll give a, a three-part answer. Uh, one is I think the Navy and Marine Corps got out there first. So I'll use for the example uh, Victory at Sea, the famous documentary, which I think won Academy Awards, um, really established a narrative of the Navy and Marines winning the war in the Pacific. Um, and then, you know, of course, the Marines raising the flag on Iwo Jima what a powerful image, captured the imagination. Uh, and as John McManus referred to earlier uh, this afternoon, uh, the, the Army has been playing catch up ever since in the, in the history wars. Uh, a second thing is for those people who are and historians who are interested in intelligence during the Second World War, um, I think a lot of the effort has been placed on signals intelligence from the Battle of Midway uh, on through the war without uh, paying the same amount of attention to the kind of tactical and operational level intelligence that was being brought, not just by the translators and interpreters, but the photo uh, uh, or aerial uh, intelligence effort uh, and, and other kinds of intelligence that were not signals related. And then the third thing is unique to the Japanese American community, which is their brothers and cousins who served in the European theater got a lot more publicity in the 100th Infantry Battalion and in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Deservedly, uh, tremendous valor, tremendous sacrifice in those wars. And they got a Hollywood movie out of it, Go For Broke, 1951, with Van Johnson, a terrific movie. Uh, but it's really hard to uh, break out of the shadows of that with the story of those Nisei who served on the other side of the world in the MIS. 
I have a comment as well. Uh, you know, World War II was called the science war. Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of resistance to science uh, from the military. And if you ask why the stories are not told, I'd ask, well, who wrote the histories? Um, because if, if scientists had been contributing to the histories, I'm sure more of these stories would have been out there. The other thing is that someone, uh, for example, like Mary Sears, she went back to Woods Hole, and she did not talk about what she did. And a big part of that was because she was working in intelligence. She was working in oceanographic intelligence, and they were all sworn to secrecy. When, when I have visited Woods Hole and talked about um, Mary's career in the military, people come up to me and they say, I worked side by side with Mary Sears for 40 years, and she never <laughs> mentioned any of this that she did during uh, the war. So I think it's kind of a multifactorial um, situation. Great, thank you. And I, I did have just a quick follow-up question for Jim. Were there any Nisei women involved with the MIS program? Yes, and, and the irony is, and, and a couple of the, the male veterans told me the, the irony was their sisters were much better in those Japanese language schools you know, <laughs> when they were growing up than they were. The Women's Army Corps dragged its feet until 1943, and they began accepting uh, Nisei women there were a few nurses as well, uh, and they went, for example, the Army had a huge program in St. Louis, uh, the Army Mapping Service, uh, and they, they sort of pillaged the archives of the lap, map collections at the Library of Congress and spent many months translating those Japanese maps into English for use in the strategic bombing campaign and the planning for the occupation. And then by uh, early 45, they sent a group of uh, Nisei women of wax uh, to the language school, and they were in training uh, when the war ended, and they were flown to Tokyo, I believe in January of 46, uh, 13 Nisei women, only to find out that MacArthur had banned the Women's Army Corps from his headquarters. So in fact, uh, they were all offered uh, uh, appointments as War Department civilians, and all of them accepted and continued to serve in Tokyo uh, during the occupation as War Department civilians. Great, thank you. And actually, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask individual questions. So I take back what I said, and I'm actually gonna ask, because <laughs> now I'm thinking. So with Mary and her role that she played, I don't wanna give away your book, because you really should buy all the books and read them, but as a little bit of a teaser, what, was, what were some of the challenges that she faced in her role as a woman in this, in this type of environment during World War II in the military? What was that like? You know, it's interesting. I think people assume because Mary was a female that she faced a lot of challenges. But from my observation, Mary fit in seamlessly with the military. Uh, she was a very reserved person. She understood hierarchy. She came in, and this woman uh, served on two Joint Chiefs subcommittees. Uh, the Subcommittee on Oceanography, which from the first day she got there, there were a group of men, and they kept, you know, I have the minutes from these, from these meetings, and they kept talking about what needed to be done, but nobody did anything until Mary showed up. And when she showed up, she, she became the secretary of the committee, and the minutes, here's Mary giving a report on uh, the drift of objects at sea, and here's Mary you know, doing the current maps, and here's Mary uh, collecting all the information to get reports out to people. Um, and part of that was the men were coming and going, right? They were being deployed, and Mary wasn't. Mary was staying in D.C. Now, I'm not saying that she didn't face uh, any adversity in her career. She certainly did early on when she wasn't allowed to go to sea. And it's kind of poetic justice that this woman now has a USNS Mary Sears, a naval uh, oceanographic ship named, named for her. Um, but it, yeah, she was of that generation. Yes, there were challenges, but she just rolled right through them, as far as I can tell. Thank you. And then, Dave, we have in the Liberation Pavilion, mm -hmm. there's a gallery basically about social 
change mm -hmm. after World War II. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that our curators have highlighted, and it's highlighted in the short video that we have there, is that a lot of people who served, they came back home and went on to have pretty prominent leadership roles yeah. in different activist communities after the war. So maybe going back to your first book, were there any vets who came home and contributed to like a, a new movement for yeah. social progress? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there was quite a few of them, but one in particular that I'll highlight is uh, Gabriel Navarrete from El Paso, Texas. Gabriel had been serving with the Texas National Guard since 1939. When he was promoted to sergeant, and they were in Camp Bowie in Brownwood, Texas, they wanted to go out and celebrate and, uh, into town. Well, there's not much to do in Brownwood, Texas in 1939. So they went to a hamburger joint where they were told they, have to, they cannot go, they cannot eat inside the restaurant because they're Mexican. They have to go out and back if they wanted to. Well, they wanted to bust up the joint, right? Gabriel talked them out of it, and they went back to uh, the base. Well, the, the, ba the base commander would come out, came back out to the, to the hamburger joint, and they said, why aren't you serving the, these men? They're, they're in the part of the US Army. No, they're not. They're Mexicans, the owner told them. And told the colonel, you can take your Mexicans, and you can leave too. Well, the colonel told them, OK, let's all go back to the base. He put a standing order that no military personnel is going to enter that hamburger joint, or you will be fined. Well, the owner of that restaurant came crying back to the military base <laughs> saying, oh, we're sorry, we're gonna, we'll go ahead and feed you know, anybody who comes in in, in uniform. You know? And they, they allowed them to go back and eat at that restaurant, but not before they fined her $500. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Gabriel had taken the test because they thought he was such a good officer that he should, I mean, a, 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 a enlisted man, that he should be an officer. They, they, they wanted him to go to officer's candidate school. He took the test three times and passed the written test. Each time during the oral, after the oral test, Gabriel was told, I'm sorry, we're not going to send you to officer's candidate school because you have too much of an accent. Gabriel Navarrete was leading his men at Salerno, was wounded. And when he returned back to the unit, he was commissioned an officer in the United States Army but not until he proved his bravery on the battlefield did that happen. After the war, now Gabriel would go on to command Company E during World War II. And when he returned back to El Paso, he was the veterans officer for the city of El Paso. And while he's there, he's noticing that a lot of the men that served under his command never received their medals. And he was instrumental going through all of their uh, uh, documents and making sure, you know, Ricardo Palacios Jr. of El Paso never got his Purple Heart when he was wounded at San Pedro. And uh, Gabriel was uh, very instrumental in gathering the men of Company E in the 141st in El Paso. And they formed a company club, basically, Company E Club. And they would hold dances. Uh, for the community, they gave to charity. Um, so Gabriel was very instrumental. And last month, I toured Captain Gabriel Navarrete Middle School in El Paso, Texas. All right, so thank you to my panelists, and I think what we can take away from everything that we heard is this idea that we can, we can talk about the battles and the campaigns. That's part of why we're here. Obviously, it's a war. But unless you understand who's doing the fighting, and unless we understand some of these different voices, you actually don't understand the war. You need to bring both of these things together. So I thank our panelists for showing us how to do that and to do it well. And I will turn it over to my colleagues for Q&A. Well, round of applause for our wonderful session. Thank you. The first question is going to be up towards the front with Connie. To your left, please. Dave, I got a question for you. Uh, as I understand it, there was one Mexican fighter squadron that 
was sent to the South Pacific, I believe, to the Philippines. Right. And uh, you don't hear very much about that. I wonder if you had done some research on that and had, uh, had, had spread the word a little bit about it. Yeah, I do know a little bit of the history of the 201st Fighter Squadron that was out of Mexico. Mm -hmm. They were from Mexico. They weren't uh, uh, an American unit. Now, a lot of people go, wait, Mexico was in the war? Yes. <laughs> they actually uh, sent a unit. Yeah, they were P-47s, just like Oscar was flying um, uh, out of Lishima. These guys were flying it in, out of the Philippines. Um, but yes, Mexico did send, and one, was one of the few instances where Mexico actually contributed strongly to, to World War II was the 201st Fighter Squadron from Mexico. Next question is going to be towards your right, about halfway back with me, please. Can you say a few words about the post-war career of Mary's partners in crime, especially the barnacle lady? <laughs> <laughs> um, a, well, the, the one I know the best, obviously, is, is Mary. But um, yes, Dora Henry. Uh, went back to the University of Washington, where she spent the rest of the rest of her career, and it was incredibly difficult for me to find any information about Dora Henry because she existed before the internet. And when someone prominent in science uh, passes away, their colleagues write a memorial to them, and it's published in in like. Uh, their journal, their academic journal. And I found one of these memorials. It had about five co-authors. And I emailed every one of them, and only one of them was still alive, and she wrote back to me. And she knew everything about uh, Dora Henry. But, you know, Dora Henry was an esteemed barnacle expert, I, just internationally known. People, what, what her friend told me, people would send specimens of barnacles and bottles and cans and all this stuff. And her friend had to clean this out after, after she died. Uh, so this stuff was everywhere. The other interesting thing about Dora Henry, she was married to Bernard Henry, who was a bacteriologist at the University of Washington. And because of the anti-nepotism laws at the University of, of Washington, Dora had to remain a research assistant for 30 years, 30 years, our most esteemed um, um, barnacle expert with you know, probably 60 publications at that point was still classified uh, as a research assistant. But again, she didn't, let that, she didn't let that stop her. And one of the other more interesting stories I'm, I know about Dora is that um, she, christ she christened the ship the US Tommy Thompson. Tommy Thompson was the head of oceanography at University of Washington, and an oceanographic survey ship was named after him. She christened that ship, and then uh, after she died, her ashes were spread from that ship along with the ashes of her dog. <laughs> so I, in Mary Greer he had to testify at the uh, House Un-American Activities um, hearings because of this, she had a brother-in-law in, in the Seattle area who had joined the Communist Party. And she spoke very eloquently about their, the work they did in oceanographic intelligence during the World War II, and just basically push, pushing back on the McCarthy, it's like, well, where, where were you? I mean, were you doing what we were doing? We were helping win the war with oceanographic intelligence. Uh, so nothing ever came of that. And she worked uh, for the US Geographic Society in Washington uh, and, and finished out her career there. And then Finner Chase uh, was a very prominent uh, carcinologist at the Smithsonian and finished his career there. He's a very, very esteemed fellow. Next question is to your left, towards the front with Connie, please. Uh, yeah, this question is for Jim. Um, could you talk a little bit about when the, the Nisei soldiers went to the military training, could you talk a little bit about the classes, the instruction that they experienced, the length of time they were there before they were sent uh, into the, to the fields of conflict? Sure. Are you talking about the linguists then? Yeah. The typical course was six months 
um, and they had to do sort of a refresher on basic Japanese and, and then military terminology um, before they were sent out uh, into, the, into the theater. Uh, they would often deploy in large groups of, they get shipped out to the theater to Australia or Hawaii in, in groups of 20, 30, up to 50 at a time, and then they get parceled out. The typical um, our alignment was, was 10 per division, which works out to two per regiment. Um, but uh, yeah, so an interesting aspect of, of starting the language training was, was that there were no uh, curriculum materials available. So the, starting with the four initial instructors headed by John Iso, um, they had to write their own materials as they were teaching the classes. Uh, and, uh, and then they were getting feedback from the field about what to emphasize or what not to emphasize. Um, it turns out that the, the ones, the students who were not very good language learners were typically much better as, as um, speaking and listening, so they could interrogate prisoners or guard prisoners of war. Uh, but, the, the, but a lot of the Japanese handwritten documentation that was found on the battlefield was written in, uh, in Sosho, a, um, a very hard to read handwriting. And really, you had to be a Kibei who had spent years in school in Japan to be able to read that kind of material. So it really varied on their, their level of competence going into the school. But generally, it was six months training. Harry Fukuhara, whose picture I showed you there, uh, was drafted out of, out of um, a Heart Mountain camp. Uh, they grabbed him in the fall of 1942, um, before they called for volunteers for the 442. Um, and, and, uh, they didn't give him any basic training. They sent him straight to the language school. They realized how good he was, and they deployed in, I think, four or five months. He complained, hey, before you send me into the war, don't I need basic training? And they said, no, no, you'll get it when you get to Australia. So <laughs> he arrived in Australia, and his buddies, and then after, after uh, a couple months, was then deployed forward with the 41st Infantry Division to New Guinea and complained that, hey, guys, you're sending me into combat. I don't even know how to fire a rifle. So his buddies had to show him how to strip down and, and reassemble a rifle wow. and fire it. Uh, later, when he went to and was given a direct commission, he, he tells me that he had, uh, he reminded the, the, the people who were commissioning him, you know, I've never had basic training. And he retired as a full colonel in the 70s, having <laughs> never had basic training. <laughs> full bird colonel. Yeah. <laughs> Next question's going to be to your left, about halfway back, please. Um, hi, so um, I definitely agree that, because uh, I'm an educator, I think that we should definitely uh, talk more about various perspectives of um, diverse groups who served in World War II. So that leads me to this question. Um, how were Afro-Hispanic soldiers treated in comparison to, say, um, Mexican or other more white um, Hispanics serving in the U.S. military, um, and uh, were this group of Afro-Hispanics segregated, such as African Americans? And the second uh, part of the question is, why did the United States choose, generally speaking, not to segregate Native Americans, Mexican Americans, and non-Japanese Asian Americans? Sorry, very long question. <laughs> I assume that one's for me. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't talk uh, about Afro-Hispanics. Afro I know that there was a Puerto Rican unit, the 65th Infantry Regiment that, uh, out of Puerto Rico that served. Um, I, I'm trying to remember the second part of your question. Um, the other minorities. Mm. The uh, reasoning for segregating oh, yes. black service yes, members, yes. So, but not other. Yes, so minorities. Mexican Americans, Hispanic Americans were not generally segregated. And that's what made the unit that I wrote about very unique, because they were segregated. In 1939, there were two National Guard units in El Paso, Texas. Company H was a weapons platoon, all white. Company E out of El Paso was completely made up of Mexican Americans from the barrios of El Paso. And I had a relative who served in the unit, and I was just looking to just tell his story 
to, at the beginning. But when I realized the significance of the unit, the focus of my story shifted from just telling my relative's story to the entire unit. Um, and we have to look at the numbers of Hispanics. Now, it's estimated that a half a million Hispanics serve. I generally think that that number is much larger because Mexicans in the US Census were classified as white. So to me, that number is probably a lot larger than a half a million. We have time for at least one last question, and it's going to be to your left all the way up front. Yeah, this is for you, Catherine. Uh, first of all, I, I wish Mary Sears had been more of an expert on the hedgerows of Normandy. Uh, <laughs> but was there any attempt to use uh, Navy resources such as submarines and so forth or UDTs to validate some of the data in the field uh, as, they were, as we were getting into the Western Pacific? Obviously, she was reporting, or she was putting together studies but was there any confirmation of some of the data or the trends or the analysis that she was doing? Uh, if I understand the, the question correctly, you're, you're asking me if there was any confirmation that the information was having an impact. And um, it depends on the report, how, how the uh, feedback came back. And um, I just wanted to mention so Janus studies were done on a lot of areas where there were not invasions or operations. Uh, areas such as uh, Korea, uh, China, all these areas. But after the war, we had 60,000 prisoners of war in various, uh, over 100 uh, prisoner of war camps. And one of the uh, uh, individuals responsible for, for you know, conducting these missions to recover the POWs, he, he wrote back, a very high level uh, naval officer, and said, not only were your Janus reports the best resource we had to find these men and to navigate our way there safely, they were the only resource in some cases because we just didn't have, you know, there weren't, weren't studies just laying around like we would expect to find today that we have backfilled all that through the NSA and all that, all that sort of thing. So it, it was in the feedback from these officers, and you can find this, cor you, I could find this correspondence uh, in various places, and I know that, that some of it had an impact. As far as the submarine data, uh, and, and I want to make it clear, Mary Sears and her people were not out there uh, you know, throwing the bathy thermograph over the side of a ship and doing the measurements themselves. That was very dangerous duty. And I write about a, a young ensign who sacrificed his life doing that sort of duty. And, you know, the frogmen were going in the night before battle and, and collecting incredibly dangerous um, reconnaissance and the aerial reconnaissance that was used to look down and measure the waves. But what she was doing was taking this information and she was translating it into something that military people could understand um, because they need the oceanography for dummies version or, or what, I just, whatever. But she had to translate some pretty uh, complicated concepts uh, so that anybody could uh, understand them. Otherwise, the information was no good. You can't just take something out of a scientific uh, journal and throw it into a, an action plan and have it mean anything mm -hmm. to somebody. The other thing I, I wanted to mention, this gets a little bit away from your question, but I think it's fascinating. You know, Emperor Hirohito was a marine biologist by training, and he funded, they had 100 survey ships uh, surveying the waters in and around Japan before the war, and then they published all this information in scientific journals. <laughs> so. Where do you think some of the data that we, <laughs> yes, and Mary talked about this in her oral histories later. She said the closer we got to Japan, the better the, the data was that we, could, <laughs> that we could incorporate in the report. Back to your question about the submarines, one of the things that she com helped compile were the, was called the Submarine Supplements to the Sailing Directions, which was a new publication for World War II. 
And she took data, she took, observ she took all this bathythermograph data, and the bathythermograph was this clunky instrument during World War II. You had to throw it over the side of the ship a hundred times, and it me measured temperature versus depth. And you know, the thermoclines exist in the areas where there is a transition, especially to warmer water. So sh she could collate this data and send it out to the submarine skippers and say, here's where you need to hide, basically. <laughs> In, in, a, in a nutshell. And then she would also take their observations. They would send her back remarks about how that had worked out and what else they had seen out there. And that all went into the submarine supplement. So it was incredibly practical and valuable resource. And what a valuable resource this panel has been, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Steph Henderson, Dr. Catherine Mucci, Dave Gutierrez, and Dr. Jim McNaughton. Um,